Hey guys, welcome to a new video. In this video here, we're going to take a look at the training and validation plots inside the Autolytics Hub. So when we have the whole computer vision training pipeline, we have our data set. You can generate one by yourself. We also have a bunch of different examples in there that you can test out directly. Then you have our data set. You can go in and choose which of the models that you want to use, train it directly in the Autolytics Hub. We even have a cloud training option so you can directly use it in there as well. You don't need any code at all. Just take your data set, connect it to a model, hit train and you're good to go. Then we're going to take a look at the training and validation results. So basically how are they converging? How are they evolving over time? Over the number of epochs, I'm going to explain the training and validation plots and what we can see from them. So right now, let's just jump straight into the Autolytics Hub. We already have a bunch of videos covering the Hub. So both how we can connect the data set, how we can integrate it with RoboFlow, train different types of model, use the cloud training feature, but also go in and connect your own Google Colab notebook or bring your own agent to train your models in here. You can also train a bunch of different models. We have different integrations. You can choose which of the YOLO models we want to use, the different variations and so on. So we have a bunch of data sets. We have different projects and also models. I've already gone in and done that so you can check those videos out so let's try to go in and use one of the models that i've already trained we have this wildlife data set that we have trained a model on so right now we get the metrics here those will also be locked in real time epoch by epoch while your models are training inside the autolytics hub so you can both monitor your model while it's training but also afterwards just to evaluate if you have to retrain add more data see how it performs and if you want to deploy the model if we are satisfied with the results so first of all here we just have a train tab we have a chart tab preview deploy and also billing but we're covering all of those things in individual videos. So right now we can just take a look at the data set to start with. So it's just a wildlife data set where we're detecting a bunch of different classes. So we have a buffalo, elephant, rhino, and zebra. And here we can see the number of data. And here we see the number of images in our data set. So we have around 1000 images that we're training on, 200 in validation and 200 in the test split. So here we can just see some thumbnails with some annotations on top of the images. So again, it's relatively easy classes to go in and detect. So right now I've just trained the model for 30 epochs. We have used a pre-trained model. So this is just a YOLO small model. So it's a YOLO V8 small model. So it's now going to take a look at and explain what these charts act like means and also the different metrics that we're looking at. So right now we can see that we have a bunch of different colors. It is really nice to go in and distinguish between them. We don't have to have multiple plots and so on. So first of all, we have the mean average position 50. So that's pretty much just the precision of our classes. If we have a confidence score of 50, we also have another metric here, which is 50 to 95. And then we take intervals of 0 0.05. And then we pretty much just increment the confidence in these intervals. So the mean error position 50 here would in pretty much all cases be higher compared to the other one because we're taking into account a lower confidence score. So when I'm training computer vision models and setting up like these training pipelines, I'm mainly just looking at the mean error position at least to start with and point 50. Once the point 50 starts to converge, comes up at around like one. I'm starting to look at the other one here, basically just to see if we can squeeze a bit more accuracy out of our model. So we also have the precision and we also have the recall. And then the reason is basically that we have the mean average precision. So we're both taking a look at the precision, but also the average. And then we take the mean across all classes in our data set. So we also have the precision and recall metric, which is also very important. These are the four most important metrics when we're taking a look at update detection, segmentation, and so on. So when we're talking about precision, it is basically just a measure of like how many objects are we correctly predicting. So that is a really useful metric, but again, we can't really just use it individually. We have to use it together with the recall. And then we have the recall, which is pretty much just a measure of how many objects have the model detected in the image out of how many should it have in total. So this is a pretty cool metric because again, kind of like have to take a look at the precision and recall together. And often you will have like an F1 score as well. And you will have a position recall curve where we want to have both of them going towards one because we don't just want to have a high precision. So sometimes you can just go in and say that my model has 100% precision, 100% accuracy, but it doesn't really tell you all the details. And a good model is not just a model that has 100% or like one in precision. Because let's say that we have a use case where we want to detect like four objects in our image. Our model is able to detect three of them. So therefore it has 100% 
precision. But again, we act like miss a detection, which should have been in there. So when we measure this, we should act like know how many objects are there in our image. And that's why we use this while we're training both for our training and validation. So this is a pretty cool metric. So you can use these metrics individually. You kind of like have to use them together. The mean positions are good to just get like a high level overview. How does your model perform? And then we also have the precision recall, which basically just tells us a bit about like the true positives and also the false negatives that we have in our predictions. Then we pretty much just lock these metrics over time, epoch per epoch while we're training a model. So in the start, these metrics will fluctuate a bit more because we kind of like need to optimize our weights for this specific data set that we're trying to fine tune our model on. So over time, we will actually like start to fluctuate less and less and start like just increasing and until the end where it converges. So we want to take a look at when our model acts like converges, we want it to go towards one, especially when we're taking a look at the mean error position, the precision and also the recall. We can kind of like see here at around like 26, 27, 28, we can see that our model has now converged and it doesn't really make sense to train it for longer. Could be here like for the last one. So we have the mean error position uh, 50 to 95. It probably hasn't like fully converged yet. So we could train it like for a couple of more epochs. But again, we want to use this so we don't overtrain our model. And sometimes it doesn't really make sense to like train your model for 100 epochs if it has already converged after 30 epochs. We can also take a look at the model chart. So we have giga floating point operations per second. We have the number of parameters for a model and we also have the speed for a model in PyTorch. So this is in milliseconds, so it takes two milliseconds to do predictions with our model. So we have our train here. We kind of like already went over that for the accuracies, but we also have the losses that we need to take into account. So while the model is done training, we want to take a look at both the train and also validation loss, because this is what we're using to optimize the weight of our model. So we want our loss to decrease over time. So our model gets better and better. And then we do the mean error position, precision recall for our validation set as we went over up at the top. So we have the box loss, class loss, and DFL loss, which is the detection focal loss. The box loss is pretty much just like how does our optic detection model perform? So we draw a bounding box. So it's more like a localization loss that we're taking into account. So how good does our bounding box fit around the optic that we're detecting? And then we have our loss because we want our loss to decrease for our boxes as well or our localization error. Because again, if we draw a bounding box around a person, we also want our model to be able to draw a bounding box around the person when we do inference later on. Then we also want to take a look at the class loss because we want to classify each individual optic correctly. So we don't just need a bounding box, but we also need a correct label or a correct class assigned to each individual bounding box. And this is where the class loss come into account. And then we also have the DFL loss here at the end, which is basically just taking into account some class imbalance as well. I'm mainly just looking at the class loss, box loss, but if you have some class imbalances between the foreground objects and also the background objects, then that is also pretty good to take a look at. But again, all the losses, we want them to decrease over time. And when we're taking a look at the number of epochs, we also want our losses to converge before we stop the training. So here we can see that our model has not fully converged yet, we can definitely train it for more epochs and have our losses decrease slightly. So again, you just need to train it until your model has converged and your losses are not decreasing any longer. So that's pretty much it for this video here, guys. I just wanted to dive into like the Autolytics hub, go over the different kind of like plots, both our training and also validation plots, because it's really important when we evaluate our models, both during training, but also once our model is done training, so we can evaluate if you want to deploy the model or retrain it. So I hope you learned a ton and then I'll just see you guys in one of the upcoming videos. Until then, happy learning.